You know, in every scientist, there's an engineer. And I suppose you can say there's an engineer in every scientist. Or is that the same thing? And that's why it's so important that we study the uh, engineering school, Holmes Hall, at the University of Manoa. Uh, we, we uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, from time to time, we, we talk to Sung Choi, who's the assistant dean over there. And we catch up with him about what they're doing. And we remind ourselves how important engineering is to, you know, science education, to STEM education. After all, the E in STEM, the middle name of STEM is, is engineering. Um, and we want to, you know, encourage young people to study this area. We, we want them to build our state. You know, the middle name of infrastructure is engineering, too. When you think of um, the, the times, for example, after statehood, engineers were critically important not to build the infrastructure that's around us today. And let me add um, that we still need to build it. <laughs> we still need the engineers. <laughs> What's more is that science is taking engineering to new levels, literally, in terms of drones, autonomous vehicles. And so all of that lives at the engineering school. All of it lives right there, a few feet away from our esteemed guest, Sung Choi. Welcome. No, I live there. <laughs> I don't live near there. I live there. <laughs> okay, okay, right. So you bring up a really good subject, and I want to make a very quick explanation about STEM. This is the two-dimensional view you can have if you have a hard time understanding it because STEM should be four-dimensional, right? It's got the three-dimensional thing and it's based on time, so it has to be four-dimensional, right? So, easiest way to explain STEM. The technology in STEM should be equated to a flower that you see. A flower? Because flowers grow and die and they change. So it's the flower that you are being exposed to as a technology. And because it's a flower, you don't have to know the intricacies of STEM. You don't need to know the intricacies of the math, the science, or anything else. Because you see it, you play with it, it's your cell phone. Uh -huh. You don't have to be an expert in STEM to understand how to use your cell phone. Yeah. If that wasn't the case, we'd only be selling about 10 million <laughs> cell phones a year, and we wouldn't have all this competition, right? And we have billions of cell That's phones. That's right. <laughs> and the reason I equate to a flower is the very important roots of the flower are the math, the science, the languages, the arts, athletics, if you want to put it, whatever else you want to put down as a feeding root to what you want that technology, the flower, to be. Now, it's actually really interesting because we call it STEM, S-T-E-M. And guess what connects the roots to the flower? The stem. The stem. You heard it here. <laughs> this is important, the stem. Which is the actual engineering aspect of implementation or transportation of those theories of the science and the math and making it possible and probable in the technology, which is what you see. Yeah. Very simple two-dimensional picture that should give you an idea as to what STEM is trying to influence. And even though it specifies on the science and mathematics, if we didn't have the English as we are doing right now, we would not be transmitting this to anybody else except you and me playing, I don't know, finger games or something. <laughs> so it's very important that all the disciplines of uh, what we consider education is taken into play. But the fact that those are the roots that you need to develop is what makes the stem stronger, which is engineering, and makes the flower brighter or smelling better if you want. Ten years ago, I had lunch with a group that included the vice mayor of mm -hmm. Beijing. Mm -hmm. I said, Mr. Vice Mayor, it's wonderful that in China, 29% of all the college graduates uh, have majored in engineering. And that really makes for a better society, uh, a better nation, a better um, player in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the, in the international uh, economy. And he said, well, thank you very much. That's a very nice thought, except it's not 29%, it's 59%. <laughs> and my guess is it's at least that much now. And so every kid, every student ought to have some engineering, don't you think, to live in the 21st century? 
Uh, you know, you know, my opinion is uh, engineering is a great discipline because it really takes many facets of what we call the roots, the disciplines that we need to know, and it makes it part of your working nature at all times. Uh, we can't create anything and have other people understand it. We can't communicate that to somebody else. So that's an important aspect. But we have to also think about the fact that if we dream something up, we have to analyze it for safety. We have to analyze it to make sure it works properly. In fact, we have to analyze it to make sure it's working, to, doing the right thing. You know, when we, and you know, every time I come up here, we talk about autonomy, we talk about robots. And one of the discussion I had with one of our uh, new graduate students was, where do we lie when it comes to the ethics of robotics? On how should a robot understand the difference between right and wrong? If you create a robot to kill, does it just kill? Or does it have a set of rules that it goes through to figure out what and when it kills? So in a very similar fashion, I'm sure we were originally created with some sort of a built-in DNA that says, thou shalt not kill, randomly, right? But obviously we've forgotten about there that. Are, but there are ethics mm -hmm. to all of this. Yes, and there, right. there, need, there needs to be ethics to all of this. We had a, a guest a day or two ago who's working, I told you before mm -hmm. the show, who, who's working on the um, self-driving mm -hmm. car, mm -hmm. you know, which is so many companies are working on it and there's so much involved and it will happen, it will happen. You know you're mm -hmm. in this area. But what's interesting, what really struck me was that they, as well as doing the software, as well as doing the material science and the sensors and all that, they also think about social policy. They think about the impact of, of the self-driving car mm -hmm. on everything around us because they know how disruptive it is and they want to understand the impact. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. Uh, Self-driving cars, it's not really a difficult concept. The only reason we think of it as being difficult is because we are trying to put the self-driving car into an unstructured area. If we had a completely structured area where everybody or everything followed rules the way it was supposed to be precisely and accurately, we would have no problem. If there were only self-driving cars on the road, and you are automatically told, rule number one, if you see something coming in front of you, you turn right. <laughs> Absolutely no accidents. <laughs> the only problem is the people that drive it, us, that are the unpredictable, unstructured aspects out there. If you get into an accident, you know, if you get into a, uh, a, a riling situation, I don't know if I'm going to turn right or left. That depends on which side of the bed I got up on that day, right? So that's where the accidents come to play. Automated systems will not have that problem. So, you know, when you talk about, are we that close to automating? I, I think we're already there. We yeah. just have to figure out how do we take some of this unstructured aspects out of the equation? If we can do that, everything would probably be automated. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there are very interesting issues around it. And, and the, we are already there. Mm -hmm. In, uh, I think it was Pittsburgh, he said. In Pittsburgh, they have self-driving cars, but they always have a safety man. The safety man sits and doesn't do anything unless you get in trouble. Um, it's like your planes, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Mm -hmm. The planes fly themselves. Yeah. And this is all, you know, when I see a picture of a safety car, and he showed me one yesterday, I see engineering issues all over the place. That's right. And, and, of course, the software is very important. But in a sense, software and engineering are married now, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, if you think about engineering in terms of the separation of electrical, mechanical, civil even, and computer science or computer engineering, everything has to come into one play because it's not a distinct aspect where you're trying to create a larger mechanism that works separately. The reason I pull in civil engineering is you have to remember a lot of these structures are becoming very large. And I don't see if there's a difference between buildings or something like the satellite space station. They are a building that just happens to be flying around. So all the engineering disciplines come together and they need to be in harmony to work properly. And that, that's the whole part of this, in, in, you know, incremental engineering development. We're, we're trying to get to that final product. Obviously, if we didn't have bottlenecks like power sources, maybe we'll get to that dilithium crystal thing, mm -hmm. we would have less of an engineering problem because a lot of our deficiencies that we see right now would be resolved right away. So where's the line, Song? 
You know, yesterday we had Vasilis Sirmos, the uh, mm -hmm. Chief of Research and Innovation, VP, VP Research mm -hmm. and Innovation at UH with the whole university. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about science. Mm -hmm. He's talking about research in science and innovation using, you know, the discoveries in that research. So, question, where's the line between engineering, if there is one, maybe there is none anymore, uh, between engineering and science? So, so, I believe there is really no line. Um, Hawaii, traditionally, and the University of Hawaii, has traditionally been a science school. We study astronomy, we study oceanography, and they used engineering as a support mechanism to enhance their studies. I think that role may be kind of reversing because now we have uh, engineering, the robots, uh, automation, uh, the computers just gathering data doing so much more than the what sensors. they expected. The sensor, yeah. what the scientists had expected. You know, a good example is a botanist usually sits here and watches a plant grow, and they go maybe every other day and measures and says, oh, this grew two millimeters. Oh, this grew four millimeters. And this is over a week. You know, if, we, if you put a camera to it, and the way an engineer would do it would be, we'll just measure it every 30 seconds. And we got more data than you could ever think of. Oh, yeah. So the botanist's first question when we did this for him was, uh, what do I do with all this data now? Because it's way more than what we were expecting. Now, maybe that data gives him other theories to work on. In Why? Botany. Yes, that's right. Why things happen. Now, at that point, because of the efficiency and the effectiveness that engineering has brought to this science, it's creating a change in how they look at that science. So they have to be married at some point. You, you, you're you an assist to everything. That's right. You can't, you can't do these experiments. You can't gather this data. Mm -hmm. You can't, again, sensors. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need engineers to do that for you. You're the enabler. Mm -hmm. That's what you are. You're an enabler. Well, you may not only be the enabler, because when you get that technology and that engineering aspect to a point that is gone beyond, like for the botanists, that they're collecting more data than they know what to do with. It's changing how that science is being looked at. So it has to be a marriage between the two. Including medicine, by the way. Of course, one, medicine One of is a our staff, yes. who is one of your students, mm -hmm. went last year to, I think, UCLA mm -hmm. for a summer intern program, and as an engineer, he was working in the medical, the medical school there, mm -hmm. uh, doing medical projects using, I guess, biomedical engineering. That's right. And that's, that's really an interesting connection because at a microscopic level, it's engineering. It's physics. It's engineering. Well, microscopic as well as macroscopic, because if you look at biomedical, one of the first things that should come to your mind is something like the Terminator or humanoids, <laughs> because you're creating prosthetics that are mechanized and automated that will help you live closer to uh, what you were when you, lo you know, before you lost uh, an appendage or something. So we're, we're getting there. Well, I want to take a break mm -hmm. for a moment, uh, Song Choi. And I want to come back and talk about the events that you are having and celebrating sure. engineering coming soon this spring and, uh, and see where we are in terms of connecting all this with the um, you know, other activities in the community and in other scientific areas. That's Sun Choi, Assistant Dean of, the, of, the, of Holmes Hall, the School <laughs> of Engineering, College of Engineering at UH Manoa. We'll be right back. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Hike! <laughs> 11 o'clock rock here with Sun Choi on Think Tech Tech Talks. And we're talking about have you hugged your engineer today, among other things. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've really, that was an interesting discussion in the, in the, in the, in the previous uh, part of the uh, talk show. But 
going now to the connection, you know, I mean, one thing comes to mind to mm -hmm. me, uh, you're going to have an insert in a newspaper? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what is that about? So uh, every year, because um, February 19th to the 25th, so it's, of course the dates will change, but it's usually the last week in February, is Engineers Week, and it corresponds with of all people, George Washington, who happened to be a tinkerer, and as a tinkerer and inventor, he is an engineer, right? Boy, that puts it out really early. That, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, so starting next week, there's a lot of events that honor and bring light to engineering and how it's such an integral part of society, like you mentioned. And uh, on the 18th, we actually have a uh, uh, VEX tournament at Windward Mall. And it's a Saturday, and it starts, I believe, at 9.30 and goes until about 12.30. They also, I believe, have uh, engineering exhibits where many of the companies have their displays out. And that may also be on the 19th, which is a Sunday. And on the 20th, we actually have the 2017 Hawaii VEX IQ State Championship at the Hawaii Convention Center. And that is open to the public where many of the middle and elementary school teams uh, that have actually won regional tournaments in the state of Hawaii are coming up to see who will go to Louisville, Kentucky to compete in the world championships. Of uh, VEX. So, uh, VEX. Oh, okay, well, what is VEX? VEX is a scholastic robotics program. It has a lot of similarities to some of the first LEGO and other programs that you may have seen. But uh, because of its lower cost, it attracts many, many students to this uh, competition. Uh, you know, one of the goals that I had when I talked to you a long time ago and we started bringing robotics in 1999 was to see if we can get some sort of 100% enclosure of all the schools. But we're not quite there yet, but we are getting there. And, you know, if you have time, we suggest you come out and watch some of these tournaments and cheer your favorite teams on and maybe even take it back to other family members so we can have that growth by word of mouth. So they can come down. Anybody can come Anybody down. can come down. It's free. This is all day on uh, the 20th of February, which is a holiday, which is, I believe, President's Day. Coming very soon. Mm -hmm. And it's at the convention it center. Is com it is President's Day. Yeah. Um, not all presidents, just some presidents. Never mind. We don't well, anybody that had, not anybody that had that title. <laughs> 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 and, and, of course, because it's engineers, we, we have other things uh, during that whole week. Uh, so on the 21st, there's actually a Society of American Military Engineers luncheon uh, with some uh, people talking. On the 22nd, uh, we've implemented our College of Engineering Career Fair. Oh, yeah. This is very important. That's right. If you want to be an engineer, you should spend time there. Huh? So, so uh, uh, good plug-in for this is it's not only for our College of Engineering students. If you are interested as a company or even just as an individual trying to figure out what, company, uh, what some of these companies are looking for, you're more than welcome to come. It's between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock. It's at the Manoa Campus Center Ballroom, hmm. and it's open to the public. Oh, that's nice. That's plenty of space, too. We want people to stop by. This year, I believe we have 78 companies coming. So surprisingly, uh, even though the university has its own career fair, our College of Engineering career fair usually ends up being larger than majority of these. <clears throat> and the good news is that you'll be at each of these events, won't you, Sung Choi? I'm going to try. I'll okay, try well, see, now, if you want to meet that. Sung Choi, <laughs> just go to these events, and he'll be there, and he'll talk to you. Yeah. So the last one I want to mention as part of our, uh, this thing is, uh, you know, there are other events going on. Many of our engineering societies are having uh, uh, outreach events that, you know, highlight engineering, but on the 25th of uh, February, which is wow. Saturday, we actually have an Engineers Week banquet, and they will honor people like the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, Engineer of the Year, Young Engineer, and of course for us, we always honor a Student Engineer of the Year Award, and if you haven't, you can go check some of the uh, internet web pages or I think it's uh, hceshawaii.us, and you can look at all the stuff. But uh, it, it's quite a thing when we have about 250 uh, engineers plus some of their family members show up. Yeah. And let me put in a plug in. Um, uh, the person that developed Tetris, Hank Rogers, uh, yeah. will be talking about 
dreaming big in oh, engineering. Oh, he's good for that. Yeah, because that is some of the things that we are trying to promote. How can I go? I mean, is there a, a site or someplace the, I can the, sign up? The HCES, the Hawaii Council of Engineering Society's website, will have a, a, a page that you can go in and uh, log in. Uh, the other thing is, you know, for yourself, all you got to do is call me. Right? <laughs> I'll call you. <laughs> and, and I believe there there is another event. I believe there is a, a showing of a film called Think Big at the Ward uh, Theater. Uh -huh. uh, That's big. And it's on engineering. And I believe it's the 23rd of February. So we're trying to highlight a lot of our engineering professionals. Really getting out people. there. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're trying to populate these days. So you'll figure out some way to get exposed to uh, engineering. Uh, you know, of course, you know my involvement with the uh, Department of Education. We're trying to uh, constantly have people understand engineering better. These robot tournaments and everything. It's not to get people to understand robotics in a year or six months. It's to, number one, expose students because we live in pretty much nowhere. We are the most isolated place on earth. So we're trying to expose new technologies, new uh, uh, careers, new disciplines to our young students. We also want to use things like this robotics to encourage students to uh, look further into these uh, disciplines. And then, of course, we want the teachers to educate them. And then with the education, we want the teachers to uh, empower the students to learn on their own. Yeah. And of course, we've always left one aspect out, which, we ha which I decided to add, and that's the final one, which is expectation. And that's expectation on two sides. From a teaching side, I have very specific expectations about where I want my students to go. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand that the students need to have expectations as to where they're going to end up at the end of that rainbow. If there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, why go on that rainbow? Sure. So we need to develop that industry here, you know, whether it's the Alumni Association uh, working with the College of Engineering to create more high-tech industry, or having somebody with a lot of capital, like the Omidiers or the Ellisons, come in here and create new but industries. Then you have entrepreneurship, you That's build right. a company, That's right. you take the engineering ideas and you make them into uh -huh. what, manufacturing, uh, or otherwise you make money with them, maybe a lot of money. That's right. Yeah. So what uh, Vasilis, also uh, uh, our colleague, uh, electrical engineer, was talking about with the innovation entrepreneurship, it is a way of bringing everything into a full circle. We're, we're trying to create industry and we're trying to create the people that are going to be working in that industry. And hopefully there is a nice merger that takes place where we won't be losing all our intelligence to other places mm -hmm. like people fear. It's, it's the profession. If you build a profession, there's a certain magnetism mm -hmm. about that. And people want to stay with their colleagues. They want to form companies. Mm -hmm. They want to practice engineering mm -hmm. with their colleagues. Well, I mean, you know, what you and I have always talked about, we don't want Hawaii to to be that old saying of the gateway to the east and the west. We want Hawaii to be the center of excellence in engineering for, yeah, it, to that. for people to come here. Yeah. And we want them to come here and also enjoy what nature has to offer. You know, I mean, we have the best air, we have the best beaches, we have the best surf. But you know what? The most important thing to a professional and to an engineer um, is being with colleagues, mm -hmm. sharing in intellectual ideas, sharing things that they learned in school, taken taken further, you know, mm -hmm. taken to into that center of excellence. Well, th that brings up another point. So, <coughs> April twentieth, we have our College of Engineering banquet, annual banquet, which attracts about a thousand people. My God, you have enough yeah. things going on. Yeah, well, we <laughs> have many, many things. Uh, you know, we you know we were talking about engineering alumni uh, a couple days ago, and I realized. College of Engineering is 109 years old this year because we were established in 1908, one year after uh, UH Manoa. And I'm, I was trying to throw out numbers, and I was like, we must have graduated about 10,000 people. And assuming you know a certain percentage has passed away, a certain percentage is not living here anymore, I, I still think there must be about 5,000 College of Engineering graduates. Still here, still, still, still around, yeah. still part of the profession. Yeah. So we want to see, like, our banquet, have more of this yeah. colleagues and old friends yeah, come on. Yeah, that's and great. see what's going on. It means because... more, much more than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. But before we run out of time, I want to talk about the science fair. Okay. Coming in April, and every time I go to the science fair, and I go every year, 
I always see you there. I always interview <laughs> you there. I always enjoy your energy there, and you are dedicated, you know, completely dedicated to science fair. Let's talk about that. So, so science fair, in my opinion, is a little bit different than these robotics type aspects. Robotics is more group, uh, group activities, working together, understanding the teamwork, understanding really the communication aspect of how to work together. Now, when I look at the science fair, it's a little different. It's like giving you a spoon and saying, dig your way to China. <laughs> because you have to understand that research involves the dedication of constantly digging to find that answer. And that's a different aspect of your personal development in terms of science and engineering. Yes, you got the group effect, but you have to also be that expert of one, right? That you have to be, you can be jack of all trades but you have to be a master of one. And we want people to understand that. And we want to take that mastery and your expertise in an area and combine it with this other teamwork group, big dream, big project aspect, and come up with the new ideas and disruptive ideas that are going to change. You know, one of the most disruptive ideas I've seen has to be the way business is done through Uber. What a different concept. It is. No. We live in a world that's changing all the time. And, you know, what I get out of this is that, um, you know, kids, especially mm -hmm. kids in Hawaii who we know and love, and, and you can see that Song is an excellent educator. He's a teacher, uh, a kind and engaging man for kids. Um, you know, there's two things. One is they have to see that science can solve huge problems. That's right. And two is they can be involved in science and solve those problems. And they can and should have the confidence. That's the science fair to me. They develop confidence. They can not only do it, but they can leverage it elsewhere. They can talk to people. They can spread the word about their science and their discoveries. And thus they can participate in a world process, making a better world. There's no better psychic benefit than that, aside from the money. So, you know, when you see them all together in April at the science fair, at the convention mm -hmm. center, it really is a pitter pat for oh, me. Oh, it, it, is. it and, is. And I know it is for you. I, I know how excited so you get about it. So what we should do is we should put in a plug right now saying all the engineers and scientists that are out there as professionals, they should all be participating as judges so you can give that one encouraging comment that may end up being the student that finds the answer for cancer or yeah. finds the answer for energy. Yeah, so it's, it's more need. than just the scientific right. projects. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a discovery for mm -hmm. those kids. It's a statement of confidence in those mm -hmm. kids. It's a huge statewide collaboration, a process of coming together. So, and you're always involved, and I really appreciate I'm, that. I'm always glad you're there as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you, son. You'll Anytime. come down again? Anytime you want.